Welcome back to our final special episode on the lead up to the Civil War. Five months separated President Lincoln's election and the bombardment of Fort Sumter. The South began to secede. Politicians were maneuvering and trying to strike deals and attempting to hold the crumbling situation together as a lame duck president. I am Brendan Forrest, and this is Civil War. November 6th, 1860. Lincoln was elected the 16th president of the United States. He received 1.8 million individual votes and 180 electoral votes. His vice president was a man named Hannibal Hamlin. Republicans would win a majority of the seats in the House of Representatives. Democrats won the Senate, but would lose control to the Republicans following secession. South Carolina legislators signed the Ordinance of Secession on December 20th. They became the first state to withdraw from the Union on Christmas Eve. Governor Wilkinson Pickens issued a proclamation declaring the state to be separate, independent, and sovereign. Pickens later authorized troops to fire on the Star of the West, a Union ship attempting to resupply Fort Sumter in the first military engagement of the Civil War. Major Robert Anderson, a veteran of the Black Hawk, Seminole, and Mexican Wars, in command of the U.S. Army garrison at Fort Moultrie in Charleston Harbor. On the 26th of December, he relocated the entire garrison to the island of Fort Sumter under the cover of darkness. This secret movement outraged South Carolinians. A delegation from Charleston failed to persuade Anderson in removing himself from Sumter. Major Anderson and his forces will remain there for the next 109 days. December 28th, South Carolina commissioners penned a letter to President James Buchanan reproaching the recent relocation of Anderson from Fort Moultrie into Sumter. It concluded, we are forced to suspend all discussion as to any arrangements by which our mutual interests might be amicably adjusted. And in conclusion, we would urge upon you the immediate withdrawal of the troops from the harbor of Charleston. Under present circumstances, they are a standing menace which renders negotiation impossible, and as our recent experience shows, threatens speedily to bring into a bloody issue questions which ought to be settled with temperance and judgment. It was gloomy in Washington, D.C. on New Year's Day, 1861. The White House held its usual New Year celebration with a cheer appearing to be somewhat forced. South Carolina soldiers seized and occupied Fort Johnson in Charleston Harbor on January 2, 1861. The fort had been in near derelict condition and was poorly defended by federal forces. The next day, Delaware refused to join the South, and the War Department canceled plans to ship guns from Pittsburgh to the forts in the South. Former Secretary of War John B. Floyd, who resigned four days earlier, was shipping weapons and large guns south for the past several months to help build up the southern arsenals. A commission found he was successful in shipping over 115,000 firearms to southern states. His treasonous actions would cause him to relinquish command and flee from Union forces before the surrender of Fort Donaldson in February of 1862. January 4, Alabama troops seized the federal arsenal at Mount Vernon, and on the 5th, Alabama troops captured Forts Morgan and Gaines. These forts provided commanding positions over Mobile Bay. On January 9th, the Mississippi legislature in Jackson passed the Ordinance of Secession and became the second state to join the Confederacy. The Republic of Mississippi was born. The women of Jackson presented the convention with the bonnie blue flag. This flag bears a single white star on a blue field, symbolizing Southern independence. Florida seceded by a vote of 62 to 7 on January 10th. There were several garrisons of federal troops in the state, one of which was the first U.S. artillery at Brancas Barracks near Pensacola. Its commanding officer, Adam Slemmer, moved a small force to the more defensible Fort Pickens on nearby Santa Rosa Island. Southern forces seized Barrancas Barracks, Fort McCree, and the Pensacola Naval Yard. Slemmer refused to surrender Fort Pickens. On the 11th, Alabama became the fourth state to secede. The following day, heavy artillery left for Vicksburg to stop shipping on the Mississippi River. Georgia seceded on the 19th in a special convention held at the state capital of Milledgeville. The wartime governor, Joseph Emerson Brown, was an extreme advocate for states' rights. In Minnesota on the 22nd, a resolution passed offering men and money to the Union, resolving that the people of the state of Minnesota reiterate their unalterable devotion to the Constitution of the United States, and that if its provisions are strictly observed, it will, in its own words, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessing of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. The state of Minnesota was the first state to contribute men to the Union. They will become the first Minnesota regiment. January 26, Louisiana became the sixth state to secede voting 113 in favor and only 17 against. The United States admits Kansas to the Union as the 34th state on the 29th. The same day in New Orleans, Louisiana state troops seized the U.S. Mint and Customs House, capturing $483,983 in gold and silver, valued at over $14.5 million today. With a vote of 166 to 8, the Convention of the State of Texas votes for secession for the United States on the 1st of February, with the official departure date being set for the 23rd. Also on this day, Lieutenant Colonel Robert E. Lee, 
veteran of nearly 32 years of service to the United States Army, departed Texas for Arlington, Virginia, upon the secession of Texas from the Union to await developments. On the 4th, delegates from the seven seceded states meet in Montgomery, Alabama, to draft a constitution for the Confederate States of America. The provisional constitution took effect on the 8th of February. The official constitution on the 22nd. It took 116 days to draft the Constitution of the United States. The Confederates completed theirs in 18. The Confederate Constitution was similar to the United States Constitution. There were a few minor differences and one major one, the constitutional guarantee of slavery. On the 7th day of February, the Choctaw Indian Nation entered into an alliance with the Southern States. It is one of the many tribes to enter in agreements with the South during 1861. Elected on February 9th, Jefferson Davis of Mississippi became president of the Confederate States of America. He will serve one six-year term with no option for re-election. The vice president, Alexander Stevens of Georgia, receives the same terms and conditions. Stevens will hear the news the next day. The state of Tennessee rejected the proposal to call a convention to consider secession by almost 10,000 votes. It will be up to the state politicians to finagle the state of Tennessee out of the union. While states are leaving the union for the new government in Alabama, U.S. mail and commerce continues between the North and the South. The Southern Congress voted to keep the Mississippi River open to trade. This was an attempt to bring Indiana, Ohio, Michigan, Illinois, and Wisconsin to the Confederacy. Optimists in the South believed the Northwest would secede, feeling that they had received unfair treatment from the Eastern moneyed interests of the Wall Street. On February 11th, President-elect Abraham Lincoln boards a train leaving Springfield at 8 o'clock in the morning for Washington, D.C. He was one day short of 52 years old, the youngest president ever elected up to that time. Before departing, he addressed a crowd, stating, My friends, no one, not in my situation, can appreciate my feeling of sadness at this parting. To this place and the kindness of these people i owe everything i now leave not knowing when or whether ever i may return with a task before me greater than that which rested upon washington without the assistance of that divine being whoever attended him i cannot succeed with that assistance i cannot fail to his care commending you as i hope in your prayers you will commend me i bid you an affectionate farewell four years and a few weeks later sally bush lincoln said i knowed when he went away he wasn't ever coming back alive raphael sims took command of the CSS Alabama on the 15th. This ship would become the most famous Confederate commerce raider after capturing an impressive 65 vessels during her three-year career, a record which stands to this day. The Confederate Provisional Congress established a Navy on the 20th. After establishing a War Department five days earlier, the Confederate Congress passed an act for the establishment and organization of a general staff for the Army of the Confederate States on March 2nd. On the 28th, North Carolina voted to reject secession. The Confederate Congress voted to borrow $15 million to support the new government. On March 2nd, after the Senate rejected John J. Crittenden of Kentucky's proposal of the adoption of a peace convention, he returns home. There, he devotes his energies to keeping Kentucky neutral. Abraham Lincoln swears in as the 16th President of the United States on March 4th. In his address, he states, I have no purpose, directly or indirectly, to interfere with the institution of slavery in a state where it exists. I believe I have no lawful right to do so, and I have no inclination to do so. He goes on to state that in your hands, my dissatisfied fellow countrymen, and not mine, is the momentous issue of civil war. The government will not assail you. You can have no conflict without being yourselves the aggressors. You have no oath registered in heaven to destroy the government, while I shall have the most solemn one to preserve, protect, and defend it. On March 11th, the Confederate Congress adopted the Constitution of the Confederate States of America, backdated to February 22nd. General Scott told President Lincoln he is unsure how long Major Anderson could hold out at Sumter. Scott states it would require a large fleet, including 5,000 regulars and 20,000 volunteer troops to relieve the fort. At this time, the entire United States Army contained fewer than 16,000 troops. On the 18th, old Sam Houston, governor of Texas, refused to take an oath of allegiance to the Confederacy. Braxton Bragg in Florida refused to permit further Union supply of Fort Pickens in Pensacola Bay. April 4, in Richmond, the state convention rejected a vote of secession by a margin of close to two to one. Major Anderson received a letter asking if he could go on until the 11th or 12th when an expedition would arrive to resupply his garrison. On April 10th, the Confederate Secretary of War informed Brigadier General Beauregard he should demand the immediate surrender and evacuation of Fort Sumter if he believed there was an attempt to resupply the fort. If refused, he would take whatever action he deemed necessary to reduce the fort. In response, Beauregard moved a floating battery close to Sullivan's Island and ordered the other earthworks manned surrounding Sumter. That day, from Hampton Roads, Virginia, the federal ship USS Pawnee sailed for the relief of Sumter. And finally, on the 11th, Colonel James Chestnut, husband of the famed war diarist Mary Chestnut, left the dock at Charleston and went to Fort Sumter to demand its immediate surrender. Anderson refused this demand and a second. A final attempt at a peaceful evacuation was attempted early the next morning, with relief for the fort sitting just outside the harbor and a garrison commander unwilling to surrender his post. Beauregard, issued orders for firing to commence at 4.30 a.m. April 12th. The war had begun.
To learn about the bombardments at Fort Sumter and the events of the first two weeks of the war, click here. And if you enjoyed this video, hit the like button. If you want to follow the war with us, subscribe and hit the notification bell below. I love your comments about the channel and the Civil War. Start a conversation with me in the comments. See you next time.